Okay, so there's a photo of the beautiful um, Riverdale Dairy at Springfield near Scottsdale. Um, so to set the scene, I guess uh, there's a few points I've made here and, and as uh, Steph said earlier on, Kate and Rodney are, are owners of the beautiful Riverdale Dairy and it is beautiful. Um, one of the good things about my job, I get to go to some pretty neat places and see some, um, you know, some beautiful things and, and this is a picture. Uh, a bit, of lot, bit like South Carolina where I grew up, if you're not going up a hill, you're going down one, Kate, aren't you? So has its challenges like all farms do. Um, but in late February 2016, I got a call from Rodney. I was, I don't know, I was driving somewhere and he asked me, um, you know, with what I just spoke about, what safe farming is about, getting that, um, you know, people talking and thinking about safety, would I come to, to their farm and sit down with the farm workers and, and have a bit of a chat about farm safety? Um, so we did that. Uh, we met at the dairy. I remember it was a beautiful, um, crisp, March morning, probably similar to what the day was there. Uh, it was pretty cold, um, but we all sat around the dairy and we had a chat about all things farm safety. And the things in particular we, we talked about were quad bike safety, tractor safety, you know, they're the things that are two, uh, the two biggest uh, killers on farms in Australia by a long shot. Uh, we talked about the importance of um, working safely with cattle, you know, I mean, handling cows in the dairy. And Kate's like me, I, I can remember getting kicked in the chest when I was a little tacker and sat on my backside in the in the herringbone shed, which is not much fun. And I can also remember my dad getting taken to by a bull and there's a little boy to see that happen. That was absolutely mind blowing, you know, that freaked me out, I thought my dad was gonna die that day. Um, and I guess the key thing we talked about was the importance of bringing up issues um, that are in the workplace and finding some simple and easy ways of dealing with that and, and communicating those messages. Um, the attitude of the, of the guys that day and, and girls was really, really good in respect to safety. Um, there was lots of interaction, lots of good discussions and lots of, lots of lesson sharings, I guess. So, you know, people might have had a, a bit of a close call or a scary moment in a certain situation and that was all fleshed out. So people took some really good learnings away from it. Um, so later on that day, Rodney and I had a bit of a chat about the paperwork side of it and at that stage, Kate and I hadn't physically met. Um, but. With that discussion with Rodney, I knew that the, the paperwork side of it, Kate was doing a fantastic job with that. So they actually had some farm safety rules in place. And I guess the important part of that was Kate was actually inducting their people and those discussions were taking place and Kate could prove that um, those discussions were, um, you know, were happening. Um, so it was clear to me, very clear to me, that Kate and Rodney were very serious about farm safety to the point where um, Kate, you'd actually put a couple of workers off for not following the rules, hadn't you? Like, um, I think it was something to do with quad bikes not wearing helmets when they were instructed to. So they didn't hold back on, um, on pulling people up and holding them to account if they weren't following the farm safety rules. Um, as I said earlier on, Rodney had a very proactive uh, attitude towards safety and he asked me at that stage whether I'd come back at some stage to have a look at the paperwork side of things and uh, that's one of the things I do. And, you know, in some respects, if um, people do have... Um, documentation in place, it's amazing how much we can streamline that and simplify that and we'll probably cover off on that a little bit more as we go on, Kate. Um, so to me, Kate was doing a really good with the safety management component of their business and little did I know at that time just how important that side of the business management would come uh, to the forefront later on down the track. Um, so with one of the key focuses of my role in, uh, in the farm safety space is getting people to talk and think about safety. And one of my greatest concerns with what I do, working proactively with businesses on farms and what have you, is if something does happen, and being an ex-inspector and done way too many fatal investigations in my time, um, you know, with Kate and Rodney, eight months later on, it happened. Um, so on the July the 13th, 2017, I got a call from Mark Cocker, the CEO of WorkSafe, to tell me that um, there was an accident, it was that call that you never want to get. So. That'll lead us into the questions, Kate. I've heard Kate speak publicly at Scottsdale at a, a farm safety session there, and it was I, I admire this lady so much for her to come out and, and to um, to talk about what happened in their business. I think is an absolutely brilliant thing for Kate to do, and the lessons that'll come out of that. So, Kate, to say July 13, 27, 17 is a day you'll never get. I think it's a bit of an understatement. But what actually happened on that day? Uh, on that day. Um one of our workers, Dale Woolley, uh, was out feeding out with the tractor and uh, he had a tractor roll over and he was killed instantly. Yeah, and that tractor was brand new too, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the tractor was brand new. It had 120 hours on it. 
Um, Dale had done about 100 of those hours. So, uh, in essence, it was his tractor. He was the main operator. Um, dairy farms traditionally employ a lot of people over the years. You have a high staff turnover generally. And hands down, he was probably the safest person we have ever employed. So... Yeah, I remember Dale being at that um, session we had at the dairy that day and he was um, uh, he was one of the ones that was very willing to share some of his experience, I mm -hmm. guess, and some of those learning, you know, those lessons. Um, no doubt he would have had a few scares on, on machinery and what have you over that period of time. And with Dale as well, it wasn't necessarily milking, was it? He was, um, he was mainly no, doing maintenance work and tractor work. He wasn't that. employed to milk cows. He was employed to do the uh, tractor driving and and that sort of stuff and maintenance and stuff. So that was his job. That's what he was trained to do. He'd done it for years. So um, I guess if you're thinking who's the likely person to go out there and not come home one day, well, he would be the last person on the list. Yeah, it'd be pretty fair to say he was. Um, he had a lifelong experience behind him yeah. before he even got on the wheel, behind the wheel on that tractor that particular day. And I suppose uh, just to step back, I... I I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and share our story because I think it's really important. And if you're in the previous session that Nick spoke at, um, I really related to what he was saying about you can have a terrible experience in your life, but it's how you actually choose to uh, look at that. He's saying you don't look for a positive, you just uh, move forward with it and find a way to, to spread that message and, take, and make something positive come from a really bad situation. So, uh, yeah... I, Following yeah. his lead, I thought it was a quite kind of a nice link to, if you're in that session, um, it, it really resounded with me, you know, it's really important that we spread the message, even though this is a farming incident that we're talking about today, it, it, a lot of these messages relate to everybody, no matter where you are and what you're doing. Yeah, I remember us having a bit of a glance at one another and a bit of a grin, we could have sort of slotted in there fairly well, couldn't we, incorporated yeah. the two sessions into one. Kate, so on that particular day... What's, what went so horribly wrong? Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit hard to be specific and uh, the short answer is we'll probably never actually know. Um, we're still subject to a coronial investigation and it's been almost two and a half years. So we're not even able to access any reports from anywhere, not the police, not WorkSafe, no, we're not able to access any of that information until the coronial um, process has finalised, which to my knowledge hasn't even begun yet. So um, that can be quite difficult to deal with. We've probably come to terms with that now. But I suppose from a personal perspective, um, it's really difficult because we're just at the point where we're moving on and trying to move forward from all of this and we know that it's still sitting there waiting to come back with full force at some stage in the future. But um, getting back, so that's why I can't really talk about what specifically went wrong because we don't actually know. We haven't been um, given any of that information. But I can uh, tell you some facts about what happened that day because I think it's important. Um, Dale died instantly, as I said, as a result of a tractor rollover while he was feeding out. He'd been employed by us for a period of six years and the last four years he'd spent on that particular property. So, as I said, he was driving a brand new tractor. It was his tractor. The tractor was fitted with all of the new rollover protect protections and the tractor only rolled once. So, I suppose that's just getting that message out that you you think you've got all of these things in place to you've given somebody the training they know what they're doing they're experienced but who so, knows <laughs> so with the feeding out just to explain to people that um that aren't sort of necessarily up to speed with what that entails on a farm basically dale had a bale feeder on the back of the tractor it was a trailing implement um and uh that had a a bale on the back of it which was probably about three quarters fed out, uh sorry about three quarters of a bale left on there so we're probably talking about three quarters of a tonne the bale feeder itself, the towing attachment, would have weighed probably close to a ton. Um, the tractor was a brand new John Deere four-wheel uh, no, drive. Sorry, uh, new, sorry, New Holland, uh, New Holland. Um, four-wheel drive, and as Kate said, had all the latest technology in it. And um, with the feeding out exercise, this bale feeder actually uh, it rotates and it turns bales out. But uh, on the situation where this was on a rise, some of the bales were being sat down, cut, and just rolled down over the bank. Um, 
and so for whatever reason, Dale decided to head down over the bank that day, didn't he? And he didn't really need to. No, and we don't know why. We don't know whether it was just a decision that was made that was catastrophic or uh, it was on hilly ground, but it's not, you know, we've had many people out there having a look. It's not that he was asked to go anywhere that was um, unsafe because people had, he'd done it millions of times yeah, before. So it was so one of his everyday tasks, wasn't yeah. it? So, um, the impact of this accident. So, for you and Rodney, I know um, prior to um, the accident occurring, um, you were both very proactive in that safety space and I know you were doing a sensational job doing what you could with the resources you had at your disposal um, and, and doing it off your own back too. You never had any outside assistance or whatever to help you through that process. Um, I know... Um, I think from memory when we sat down with the paperwork side of it, you had some, a folder that came from primary employers which had some really, really good stuff in there. Mm. Dairy Australia had some good stuff on their website and what have you, um, which, was, which was good and is, was very important later on down the track. But personally, for you and Rodney, what sort of an impact has this had on your lives? Uh, the personal impact is obviously devastating at the time. In the short term, it is something you can't even comprehend I guess it, it's just but you, the fact is we have 600 cows that have to be milked every day so you still have to try and keep things ticking over and everybody's traumatised it's not just us it's our workers it's you know it's it's the, f the family you're trying to deal with all of that for me personally um, I was probably I just let it all out so I probably cried for days and days and <laughs> Then I was sort of started to, well, what do I need to do mm. to get through this? And I'm a bit more of a, a logical thinker, I guess. What steps can I take to help to get through this? Uh, Rodney is probably a little bit different. He's probably the typical male stereotype that buried himself in work um, and just kept working and working and working. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that, do we, fellas? We don't do but, that um, For him personally, it really... I, I can't um, say enough how much it changed him as a farmer, I guess, as an employer. Um, he completely doubted everything he'd been doing for however many years. Um, he had no faith in his ability to keep people safe and protect people and himself. Um, he initially wanted to, you know, do the old... I'm not doing this anymore, it can all go, I don't want nothing to do, you know, let's just get rid of it all. But um, unfortunately it's not as easy as that even if you did want to. <laughs> yeah. And you love doing what you do. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, and obviously you don't make those decisions at, at that particular time anyway, so it's like you just had to keep um, talking to him and trying to get him to work through that process. But um, it took him two years to replace the tractor because he just could not make a decision on what to actually get. Um, and wouldn't get on a tractor. That he would feel time. safe yeah. in, that he could feel confident letting other people in. You know, it's little things like that that um, were really, really challenging was just him having that confidence in himself again, I think. Yeah. Uh, and Kate, the, so the kids were on school holidays Kids at the time were on well. holidays. So the day that this actually happened... Um, it's a really vivid memory for me. So I was at home with four kids on school holidays and I get Rodney phone me and obviously he was um, panicking, you know, um, Dale, they'd been trying to contact Dale, uh, another employee had been trying to contact him for quite a while and couldn't get hold of him. So he'd rang Rodney and Rodney thought, oh, well, that's a bit, you know, odd, I better go and see if I can find him. And obviously he found him and he rang me straight away and said he knew immediately that he was he had passed away because it was an immediate um, thing you could mm. tell. But um, he, I just said, look, you need to hang up and ring the ambulance, ring the police. Mm. Like he, he couldn't even function enough to to actually think that that's what he needed yeah. to do. So the process of this is no instruction manual. No, for this type of it thing, was is like, it? well, so what the hell, you know? <laughs> he's, Consequently, spent the rest of the day with investigators and police, and um, as I said, just just the trauma of having to deal with that. I was then left at home for the rest of the day, 
because I was under instructions from the police to not say a word to anybody because they had to have time to obviously go through the process of contacting family and uh, all that. So I was left alone to try and deal with it with, you know, uh, and trying to comprehend what had happened and I had to go in and in, um, inform all of our other staff and let them know what had happened and all of that sort of stuff. So... And as you point out, there is no manual for this. It was, you know, probably not in that immediate moment of trauma, but in the days that followed, I found it really difficult to actually... Because I tend to handle all of the um, administrative side of things, of course, but it was really difficult to know what I was actually required to do What I, in terms of... Like, I didn't know, for example, that it was a workers' comp claim. I just had the naive assumption that if someone has died, well, why are you making a workers' comp claim? <laughs> like, you know, I, I, we don't have um, safety officers. We don't have people that deal with this sort of stuff all the time. I was just fumbling my way through. So it, it was really difficult knowing what that process was and what I sh had to do in terms of the red tape and the forms that needed to be filled in and who I had to notify and all this sort of stuff. So it was really difficult. Yeah, and we'll flesh out a little bit more in a minute about the help that was available and, and where that went. Um, so, look, with the majority of farm businesses, you know, from my dealings, I deal with multinational companies down to to the mum and dad um, business, you know, the micro business, and the majority, I, I guess it would be fair to say, the majority of, of farming enterprises are exactly that. So it's a, it's a husband, a wife, uh, it might be one or two workers and it might be, you know, one of the children as they progress through part of the succession planning mm -hmm. and the taking over side of things and what have you. So to say that um, uh, your workers are, are part of your family would be a bit of an understatement as well, yeah. wouldn't it? Because I know how, how you and Rodney personally treat your workers and, um, you know, um, and having grown up in that environment myself, myself you know, it, it is a family situation. So... The, talking to your workers about this and dealing, helping them through the process as well? You've um, lost a member of your family, and a, of your work family, because they just, I think, you know, at the time we had about four or five employees, so we're only a small uh, sort of close-knit sort of group. Um, so you're not only dealing with the, the um, loss of your employee from a logistical point of view, you're also dealing with the loss of your friend. You know, this is somebody that you went to work with every day and they had a pretty close relationship. They all lived in a farmhouse on our farm, so we were trying to, you know, we had to deal with all of that as well. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the personal side of it is probably much more horrific than what it is in mm -hmm. a bigger workplace, for example. And then there's the saying goodbye to Dale. Yeah. And, um, like, personally, I know I've lived that myself, you know, growing up in South Carolina, I remember as an inspector having to do an investigation, um, a fatality that happened in the end of Lings Road at South Verona, and I grew up on the corner of Lings Road, South Verona, and there was only one family in there. So, you know, I, I've, I can really relate to that, um, and that's something that lives with me, you know, for the rest of my life. And, and when I heard about that particular accident, that incident that I personally was involved in comes straight to, you know, yeah. smack me in the face big time, and as I said earlier on, it was one it's of the even, greatest views. Yeah, it's even navigating how to appropriately deal with um, family and the people that he was close to because we were like, well, do we just stay, you know, they were really, um, really supportive of us all the way through Dale's family and, you know, we went to hit Dale's funeral and grieved alongside them and, it, uh, you know, but we were grateful for that opportunity to be able to do that because, um, you know, we we asked for permission, if you like, to be able to do that because we wanted to, but you don't know whether they might be offended by the yeah. fact that you're there. Like, you, you have to be really careful about how you how you what what your dealings are with these people, and we were really sensitive to that, and we're really grateful to, to them to this day that that they allowed us to grieve yeah. with them. So that's part of that family yeah. scenario, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And business wise, Kate. You still look. All this is going on. This, you know, there's total chaos. But you've still got to run a business. Yeah. So, how did it affect the business? How did you get through that? Uh, I suppose we just went to a coping strategy. Do the bare minimum. Do what you can to get through. Um, 
as you you know, like I say, it's the fact that we didn't we've lost a man, we'd lost lost a tractor. You know, it it was it, it compounds the situation because you have that whole other element of stress put onto it. You yeah. know, um, we still haven't replaced Dale's position because it's something. Once again, these things stick in Rodney's mind, and he can't quite bring himself to do that. You know, so Rodney's filling the void. Then? Other people are doing yeah. those duties, of course, but in terms of having that role there and replacing that role, it, we just don't feel like we can. Yeah. You know, like it, it's it's just that mental challenge of trying to work through all of those things um, that still goes on and on and on. As I said, it was two years before we, we actually um, got some... We, we paid contractors to come in and do tractor work because he couldn't go out and buy a new one. Like it's it's going through... Working your way through all of that mental, yeah, mental so it's stuff. Yeah, Two years on, basically, you've got to restructure the business in regards to the staffing levels and, and how the jobs are done. Um, and I know, you know, with Rodney, a, a lot of that's fallen back onto him or he's he's taken yeah. that responsibility back onto himself because he doesn't want to subject anyone else yeah. to that. Um, and that's a very diff- – that must be a very difficult thing for him to deal with in that, re- in that regard. Um, well, the other part of that is that if he – he, he probably thinks a little bit differently now, a bit like what you were saying before, think about what you're doing before you go out to do it. But he thinks that. But I say, well, do you place the same level of caution on yourself? Because that I think in a general sense, they forget the risk that they're placing themselves under every time they go out the door. You know, it is a dangerous um, occupation. It is a dangerous work environment. And he forgets that he is part of that, mm. you know. It's like, well, I'll do it. I won't ask somebody else. No, well, you actually need to stop and think about how much you value your safety and what you're doing. So yeah. That's that's an interesting point there because I think I can remember having a bit of a chat with Rodney who were talking about, um, you know, having a look around the dairy and things like that and the silos and things. And um, I, when I do dairy farm visits, I, I know... Um, you know, like we'll be talking about things. And, and, and silo safety is a pretty simple one, you know. You, you climb a silo, you've got no fall protection, you hit the ground, you know, you don't bounce. Mm. And I remember at a, a dairy farm in Smithton once and and the wife and the husband were there and I asked the question about silos and, and the farmer at the time said, oh, no, Phyllis, I won't let my, my workers do that. I said, so who does it? He says, oh, I do. And I said, so you won't... Be, why don't you let your workers do it? And he said, it's too risky. Mm. But yet he was doing it and he was going up there and he wasn't wearing fall protection or anything like that. And it can be as simple as just a rock climbing arse, you know, so you can tie yourself up off when you get to the top. And I said, so you do that. If you you fall, are you going to land on your feet? And he's, I, was, I felt a little bit bad afterwards because his wife sort of let him know, oh, I've told you about that before, <laughs> you know. you. So it's one of those things, I guess, where as the farm owner, you tend to, um, tend to just accept that risk and, and try and protect other people don't you know you forget about yourself yeah. and, and then if it happens to you it happens to the business so well, it's, a, yeah, it's yeah. a really important point isn't it and the other um element of that is that with all the technology and the machinery and you know people have got better i think at having newer newer uh, equipment newer machines but it almost gives people a false sense of security you know if you have you can have the um rollover protection in all these tractors. You can have the quad bike, you know, but it's not... It doesn't mean that you're immune to getting hurt, you know. It, it's this false sense of security that is embedded into all of this um, equipment and machinery and vehicles and, you know, and same with your car that you're out there driving every day. It doesn't make you immune from that risk. Yeah. So those chats we have, you know, we have every day it's like you know it's a, it's a reminder all the time isn't it a constant thing like how are we going with safety don't take any unnecessary risks we don't need to yeah. so managing safety at the time um before you and i got together and we had a look at the at your um, your systems and what have you how are you going with that how are you doing that i'd say we were pretty we were at, we were making attempts but we were probably media mediocre <laughs> in a lot of we we were doing it, but we probably didn't always have the uh, the paper to say we were doing it because, as I say, we don't have a uh, safety uh, group that meets once a month, or you know, we just we don't I don't have the resources or the people to do it. But it's it's uh, 
we did the best we could and I think we were in really fortunate that what we did have in place, as you have quite rightly, even though we don't know the outcome of investigations, we're pretty confident that what we've had, it has really helped us and will continue to help us through that process because at least we had something. Mm -hmm. It's like we've made an attempt at this. We probably, well, we didn't probably didn't have it right. We probably never will have it right. But we're doing the best we can with what we've got. Yeah, and look, I, I think from the perspective of what I do and the messages I try to get to people is there's no right way, there's no wrong way and there's no perfect system out there. And if you, you're looking for it, you'll never find it. But I think the important point is that when... Um, when you do have a crack at it and you've got you can prove that conversation's taken place, which you you know you can yeah. quite clearly do, that's the really important part. So, you know, I know from from my past life as an inspector, you have these conversations with people. I know very well a, a, a person's had that conversation with their people. But if you can't pull out some sort of documentation to prove that that conversation's taken place, you know, when it gets to, to the courts and what have you, that conversation hasn't taken place. Mm -hmm. But the minute you can pull something out, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you've got something to support that conversation, then, you know, when something does, if and when something does go wrong, touch wood, it won't happen, um, you can prove that conversation's taken place. So it starts to tick some of the boxes. Yeah. We had actually met with Dale only one week before he died. We do an annual review with all our um, employees um, every year and we make them go through the safety stuff every time <laughs> we read it out word for word and spell it out and they sign off on it to say yes I agree to what the conditions are or what you know um, he had done that one week before yeah. so the fact that we could demonstrate that very quickly to investigators um, it it automatically sets the tone for that investigation in yeah. my opinion and part of that, I guess, was the uh, proactive stuff. I know Rodney was very proactive yeah. in the safety space and so were you. Um, I guess part of that would have been, you know, the eight or nine months or what it was before the accident that, you know, Rodney ringing me and saying, Phil, can you come out and have a chat to the workers? Um, it, and all that was really was just a conversation, a bit of a reminder session, I guess, to follow the rules that you'd set in place. And it's, it's having, it all comes back to trying to do your best to create that culture that you must stop and think about what you're doing and you need to be safe out there and, you know, this stuff is important because often on farms particularly, people tend to brush it aside, oh, we'll be right, she'll be right, mate, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it's what we've concentrated on over that period of time is just trying to create that culture that it, we do take it seriously and... Yeah. Um, it's not a joke. Yeah. So what about now? Now we're probably a bit too pedantic about stuff. <laughs> but um, I suppose the best example I always use is I've been with Rodney for about 20 years now. Never, ever had he worn a motorbike helmet ever <laughs> in all of that time. And, un you know, it's unfortunate that something has to happen before you can get the message through because it doesn't matter how many times you tell him. Um, since that accident, I've never seen him without a helmet on his head. So that's just how powerful, you know, that message. But it needs to get through to people without waiting for something like that to happen. It's like, no, this stuff is really important and you just have to do it. Whether, you, you know, nobody wants... It's a bit like um, Nick again. Yeah. It, it feels bad, but it's good for you and it's good for the greater good. You, you just have to do it. Yeah, and I guess as the farm owner, that's really critical because, like, when you step back from that, um, Rodney wouldn't wear a helmet on a quad bike beforehand. But he was telling everybody else to. Yeah, and, so and you'd actually put a couple of people off yeah. for not following the rules. So, so it's a bit of a... You've got to lead yeah. by example. It's got to come from the top yeah, exactly. and then they will follow. And um, the paperwork side of things now? Uh, we have a much better... Well... We've just, we just keep tweaking at it. It's not something you can say, well, we've finished that. We just keep working away and plugging away at it. And we still... Um, it's just reinforcing that message that, you know, we will not tolerate people doing stupid stuff or making poor decisions. It's just not acceptable on our farm. If you want to be like that, then go somewhere else, uh, even though it's difficult because you can't uh, recruit people. But, um, yeah, it's just that zero tolerance and and if we've had to give people a warning or speak to them about it it's generally over because they know they're going to take this stuff seriously 
And for your confidence in doing the admin side of the stuff of the business? Much better. Mm. Uh, just the resources, as you say, like uh, Phil's helped me with stuff and I know uh, Deb's doing a lot of work uh, and Fonterra, we've, um, their field officers are doing a lot of work on the safety stuff and I commend them for that. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to make this stuff better in our industry and I think that's a credit to, to everybody getting that message through. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll back that one up too because, um, you know, with what I do, there's, uh, you know, I love the work that Deb does. She's, um, she's terrific. She's so open, so helpful. Um, steals a lot of my resources, but that's all good. If it's getting out there, that's what it's all about. It Deb, doesn't matter. It? It's that's that teamwork exactly, approach. That exactly. Is, that's why we yeah. do what we do. And if we can make a difference in that regard, it's, you know, it's well worth the time and effort that um, particularly, you know, people like Deb put in to, to try and help you guys get your head around all the sort of stuff you need to do. So... When the accident happened, help. What sort of help was available and what...? Um um, as I said, it was kind of trying to navigate <laughs> what help there was available. Um, there, and I've, I've looked at this a few times over, over that period of time, but um, I start with the police. The police that we work with locally were just amazing to us. So... Uh, um, and it's getting rid of this perception that the police and particularly um, work safe inspectors are the enemy because it seems to be this um, the way they're treated or the way that people think about uh, that sort of stuff. Oh, they're only going to come and crawl all over your place and find everything that's wrong. And <laughs> You know, this is, especially in a small community, that's the perception. And the police are a little bit the same, you know. Oh, they're, they're out to hang this on someone, you know. Like, it, it's it's that perception. And I suppose um, the surprise from all of that was we found the complete opposite. So, and I'm really uh, conscious of trying to spread that message also, is get rid of that negative connotation. These people have a pretty horrible job to do. They're out there doing the best they can. And if you treat that process with the respect that it deserves, then you will get it back. So it, it's that two-way, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't know or we still don't know, as I say, what actually caused this accident. And if we're accountable in any way, well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll accept that. It's, it's no one's um, fault. It's not the fault of the people investigating. It's not, you know, we'll accept whatever comes our way, but it's just having that open communication and we have nothing, we, we just approach it with the fact we've got nothing to hide here, we just tell the truth. And it is what it is, and we just deal with it. But that level of respect and the, the way we were treated was exceptional. So uh, it, it is really important to spread that message. These guys just seem to cop a bad rap all the time. <laughs> and it, it actually annoys me. Um, we have not had any inspections on our workplace. We've not, you know, it's... It, it must have been deemed not necessary. So, you know, like it's not what you think it is and it's, yeah, so that was probably the important. Um, the, and as far as, the, um, as I said before, about the uh, workers' comp side of things, I had a lot of help from our insurance company, obviously, because as I said, I, I was oblivious to what you were actually supposed to do. So that was really important because we did have sort of ongoing issues with them for quite some time. Uh, that was pretty difficult for me to deal with personally. So it was really good to have somebody there that could step in and, and sort of mediate that, that process. Um, Rural Alive and Well was another resource that I tapped into. Um, I actually had them out for a visit pretty much immediately <laughs> and because I was struggling in those, you know, first couple of days, I was struggling to know how to even begin to deal with it. So... Uh, they came for a visit and we offered that to all of our employees and anybody, you know, that was affected by that incident. So, and um, hats off to them. I think it's a really important resource for people to use in any situation. They're out there and they'll come to you and, yeah. Yeah, I look, from the rural so side of things, you know, they're, they're a, uh, one of the reference group members on the Safe Farming Program and, and, um, and you know, with the stuff that I do and I, I just think I, I can't, you know, sing their praises enough. I know, um, you know, there's there's a lot of um, discussion around the mental health side of things and what have you now. And I guess, um, you know, I look back in my past life as an inspector and in the early days, we didn't have that support available. Mm. 
you know, you just dealt with things the best way you could. My dad was my, you know, was was my mentor, my uh, sounding board or whatever, you know, and, and I've done some of the, the fatal investigations, particularly the one I did at South Arana with the Lynn family, you know. He was my greatest support. Thankfully, inspectors don't um, have to deal with it in that way anymore. You know, things evolve and there is good support and what have you. And from the support, uh, well, from the from the people that are involved point of view, uh, the work safe side of things and the police side of things, and me being an ex-inspector, it's easy for me to say that, you know, I, I really admire what they do because it is a terrible job. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they do have a job to do. Um, we need to look at things and try and find out what's happened so we can channel our energies in to prevent it from happening again. Um, but as I said, the support services are there that are like that, and I, I commend the WorkSafe inspectors for what they do. They have got a, excuse the way I put things sometimes, but they do have a shit of a job sometimes. Yeah. Um, but the other side of it is they, they want to work proactively. You know, they want to come there and, and help people through a process, not come there when things have gone wrong and have to try and sort things out later on. So, very, very important. Uh, just back to the support, I suppose, um, from a personal perspective, the greatest uh, support comes from your family and your friends. Um, and probably a surprising um, part of that was... I had people knocking on the door that had been through a similar experience and that was really humbling because some of them were people I did, had never met before. So, But the, they w wanted to share the awful experience they'd had to try and help you deal with that and I, I think that was just an incredibly powerful, um, humbling reminder that we're not the only ones that have to deal with something. Like, you know, th you know and, and you're part of this unique little... <laughs> group, if you like, that, that have that shared experience. So that was um, something that was really shocking for me, I guess. It yeah. was just, you know, they would just turn up yeah. <laughs> and felt that it was... Um, and that comes back to why I'm here now. It's, it's, it's just all about sharing that story and trying to prevent these things from happening and, and helping other people to make sure that, you know, we can try and alleviate a lot of this yeah. stuff. And obviously from, you know, um, for us personally, um, it was about talking with each other. Mm. We just kept talking. You know, you might say the same thing for 10 days in a row and have the same conversation. It was just about particularly I was mindful of trying to get Rodney to keep talking. Uh, I didn't want him to shut down and, and not deal with it. And I think that's probably one of the main reasons that we've got through it as well as we have, is we continue to have those conversations. And... Um from yours and Rodney's perspective personally, um, you know, I, I keep bringing the, the, the kids back into it. Um, they've lived through this as well. So how are they travelling? In That's regards fine. To but, the, you know, the, we, as usual, we've had, you know, we've had other events in our life that have been quite challenging for our kids and for us, but our philosophy has always been honesty. We told them straight away what had happened. This is what we're dealing with. We're going to be upset you know, it's going to go on for a long time. But, and occasionally, you know, now we're at that point where if Dale's name comes up, it's usually a happy memory that someone's talking about or he did this or he did that, you know, some of those joyful times, which is really nice, but they still talk about him and they still, you know, it's still his house, it's still, you know, it, it, that will never, never change because, and that's, you know, as you say, that's part of that... Um, in your face stuff initially, like Rodney has to drive past his house every, you know, however many times a day. It's always there, <laughs> you know, like, and you, you know, you've, you've got to find a way through it because you can't just block it out. So that's a little bit like um, Nick said in that last session, I guess, is foc focusing on the positive yeah. side of things and the and the good times and whatever and yeah. just try and put the, the bad stuff um, behind you. Um, from the perspective of the business... And, and the other team, I know um, your team are, are, are pretty solid. You've got people there that have sort of, you know, been there for a good while. And uh, I know they get looked after exceptionally well, and they did before this incident happened anyway. How are the, how are the rest of the team going now? Uh, they don't really talk about it much. Um, we'd already actually employed a new person before, about a couple of weeks before... Um, Dale's death and he was due to start after that so he, like he was finishing off where he was and um, 
I found that really challenging because he was only a young he's only a young guy and it was like I wanted to ring his mum up and say he's going to be okay we'll look after you know it's like do people not want to come and work here anymore because you know because they think something might happen to them like it is really it's challenging from that perspective and it's still a once again if you look for the positive I think the positive impact of his death is that our workers are more careful yeah. And they think about, they do think about what they're out there doing because it's a brutal reminder. And it's had flow-on effects to the rest of the community. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. That does say I try and spread this message a lot, and um, I like to think that there's been a significant change in the in the way local farms, particularly, um, are dealing with this stuff. I think you know it often takes uh, that personal. Um, relating to somebody that you know or this happened to them and, and you'll think, oh, shit, I better get in and do something about this and I think that has happened. So uh, that's something that, as you say, it's a positive uh, that comes out of something that's not. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad thing. But um, from the worker's perspective now, I guess, um, you know, it's probably something that's going to trigger off in their mind before they go out to do their day's work that, yeah, OK, they take that little bit of time to stop and think about what they're going to do before they do it, whereas, and like anyone that's worked on a farm has been guilty of this, you just get in and get shit done. It's like <laughs> you yeah. do what you've got to do probably without taking that little bit of time. And I guess one of the key things I've, from, from my perspective and involvement and, and the stuff I've been in, exposed to and involved with over the years is that, you know, the paperwork's all well and good, um, but at the end of the day, the reality is we're, we're relying on someone making the right call when yeah. they actually go to do something, aren't they? And... Um, so I suppose that's been a really good uh, reinforcement thing for, for the people of your community in general because I know after that event there was an influx of people, Phil, can you please come and help me? I, I'm sure Deb would be the same in her role. You know, um, we really need to get into this and, and, and we really need to try and um, do something and, and, and make sure we're capturing that conversation, you know. We hate paperwork. We don't want to create any more than that. So you know, you've heard me, Kate, I'm a big advocate. If you can say it in a sentence, don't write a book about it. Um, and you know, with your induction process and the, and the checklist you use, um, it's something that could be used on any dairy farm in the country. And I know, your, you know your, yours and Rodney's willingness to, to share your experience and, and how things have progressed to where you are today is, um, is you know, it's admirable. I just can't speak highly of enough of that. But um, we're going all right time-wise. I think sum, to, to summarise all of this and, um, you know, from... From the perspective of, of me doing the Safe Farming Program to people like, you know, Deb, the Fonterra reps and all that type of thing, um, it's a typical story of, of you know, a, a couple hard-working farmers that, you know, were having a crack at trying to do the best they could um, with what they had at their disposal at the time. Um, there's a mountain of information out there about health and safety, if you Google it, you know, you Google farm safety, it's like, oh, step back, you've got a bit to read. So one of the things we've done in the Safe Farming Program is to try and demystify all of that and probably collate it into one package that makes it a little bit more simplified and easier to find what you need to find. Um, and I know your comments on the little John Deere tractor were, you know, with the, the policies and procedures and the way that was set up was, um, I think it's full credit to the to the uh, key stakeholders of Safe Farming because it's them, it's that they've mm. pulled this stuff together and um, it's pretty good stuff and, and it's been exceptionally well received around the country and across even in New Zealand. Um, so Kate and Rodney's story, they were very serious about keeping their farmers, uh, their uh, workers and families safe. Uh, as Kate said earlier on, in an environment where hazards are an everyday part of your life, aren't they? Like, and, you know, your kids, as soon as they wake up of a morning and head out the door, there's hazards there everywhere, isn't yeah. there? So it's part of that... Um, learning process and I guess the communication side of it of, of letting people know, you know, hey, we're in a hazardous environment, we need to be careful in what we're doing and think about what we're doing. And at the same token, we don't want kids to, to not be exposed to the things that we were exposed to growing up and, and learn. Yeah, just, you've got to try and find the balance. Yeah, yeah, and keep people, keep, keep kids safe. Um, so for me personally, I guess Kate and Rodney's story just reinforces the key message I leave with workers when I, when I talk to them and you know, the same, same thing I did that day at the dairy is, look, at the end of the day, um, you know, whatever you're going to do, whatever job you're going to do is just, I guess, take that little bit of time to stop and think about what you're going to do before you do it. You know, 
as I said in the in the video clip, none of us are under the pump that much that we've got to take shortcuts or, mm. or you know take risks, unnecessary risks. So take that bit of time to stop and think about what you're going to do before you do it, and most importantly, think of the consequences if it if it goes wrong, because you know the consequences are you know it's a classic example. Um, we make the wrong choice, and but sadly in a in a farming situation, um, but that can be right across any type of industry. Is if we make the wrong choice and and it all goes pear shaped, it can be um, it can be catastrophic and. You know, you guys are a classic example of that, and you know the consequences. That there's definitely life changing. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I guess from farm owners and managers and, and even workers, the reality is that, you know, okay, we we have the paperwork in place. You had the paperwork in place, and when the investigators did their investigation, you know, you ticked the boxes there, and you could prove that conversation was was happening. You know, you're very serious about safety and to the point where you, you know, you, you hold people accountable and take them to task for what they did. And, and that's all well and good, but I guess the reality is um, that when we go to send people off to work, um, you know, just take that little bit of time to stop and ask them how we're going with safety. Is there anything there that we need to think about, we need to concentrate on or, or we need to know about so we can fix it and make it safer? Um, so the importance of getting them to report hazards, but having a simple way and a simple process of capturing that. Mm -hmm. you, you run with a whiteboard on the dairy, mm -hmm. you know, a hazard report board, encouraging people to write things down, and eventually it'll probably get to a point where nothing's being written down because you're covered off on most of the things. And if you get to that point, that's a really good thing. Um, so I guess it's about, yeah, just reinforcing that thing, about taking that little bit of time to stop and, and ask them, how are we going with safety, you know? Remember, don't take any un unnecessary risks. Don't have one of those sugar right moments because at the end of the day, it can be, it can be shattering. Um, I guess that leads us to the point where we've got an opportunity, if anyone's got any questions for Kate, uh, anything they'd like to ask her, um, perfect opportunity. So has there anyone got any questions they'd like to put to Kate? Or me for that matter? We're all good. I love it when this happens because you don't have to worry about doing the answers. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got one from John. John, that's a. Um, it's a. It's always a drawn-out process um, because there's competing. You know, there's competing issues there. There's no real set time frame around it. Um, I guess it's one of those things that uh, they'll work through the process with the, the investigators' reports and the police reports. And um, I look, I, I just don't know. I can't say. But like, you know, here we are, two years in, and and Kate and Rodney still don't know. And look, it's one of those situations there. Um, probably the reality is we're really not going to know. Um, because at the end of the day, there was a decision to made to, to, to do the job that was done for whatever reason that decision was made um, is something that's probably only Dale's going to know, Kate, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. That's the reality. So from Kate's perspective, um, yes, it's, it's – and I don't want to answer for you, Kate, but it's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, but I guess in the interim, you, you and Rodney just get on with business the best way you can. Yeah, that's right. We just um – at this point in time, um, we don't believe that we have anything to worry about in terms of that, um, the findings of that investigation. Um, but it would be nice that it, you could close the door on it. I suppose is is where we sit. But we just, you know, we just get on with get on with the job. And that that communication side between you and Rodney would be a really good way of dealing with that, and talking to one another. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely, <laughs> definitely. Not only to you, yeah. but to talk to after five years, it's still hard to remember some of the people. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's legal, um, there's legal um, time frames there for keeping um, records. And I think, you guys might correct me, is it seven years for health and safety stuff? Yeah, seven years. Um, but from a business perspective... I say to people, hang on to that stuff because at the end of the day, um, you know, touch wood, it doesn't happen. But if things do go wrong, um, from an, inve an investigator's perspective, pol we're, we're police, but it works safe or whatever, 
um, if you can pull out those records and you'll be asked about them, you know, what training, what supervision, um, all that type of thing, if you can pull that stuff out, it goes a long way to ticking the boxes and you can have the confidence to, to be able to prove that those conversations are taking place. And, and I think that's critical. And that was probably one of the key factors with, with Kate and Rodney's accident, yeah. was you could pull out some, um, some written warnings and things like that over incidents that occurred. And I would say anything that relates to uh, that side of things, you would never get rid of anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my take on it. Yeah, that's a good question, John. It's a drawn out process, I go, and you just, you just don't know, you just don't know. I know the, the, the Ling family one, that was nearly three years before that, you know, before that was finally um, finalised. Um, and so for that family, you know, the, the, to try and get on and the father of the family, the business owner was gone and, you know, to, uh, for them to be able to pick up the pieces and, and move on with that was a, was a very difficult thing and Kate and Rodney are living that every day. I suppose the only other comment on that is that we are in the um, digital age, as they say, and a lot of those records, you know, you'll see, oh, it's all right, I've saved it and it's backed up and whatever, but y you lose the hard copy stuff. So it's probably made me be a little bit more mindful about printing all these things out and actually keeping a hard copy because, you know, if your computer crashes, you have to go out and get another one. You've lost a lot of emails, you've lost a lot of... You know, you, you can lose stuff like that, so it probably makes me be a little bit more careful about actually getting that hard copy of some of this stuff now. And so you've still got a file in camera. Yeah. yeah. Becoming a thing of the past. Is it any, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Anything else anyone would like to put forward? Yep. Thank you. That no. means a lot to me. <laughs> Yeah, and look, that, that leads me into the, to the last point I'd like to make. Um, I've got a 10-year-old granddaughter who always has the last say. Um, so, Kate, I'd like to throw to you, and I don't mean anything by that, other than the fact that personally I want to thank you so much for, um, you know, for sharing your story. I'm a firm believer with what I do. If I can go through my working career and save one person from, from dying in a workplace accident, my whole working career's yeah. been worth that. And that's something I'll never know, and I'm very, very happy with that. So, Kate, in closing, what would be your key message to businesses and business owners, no matter whether it's a farm or manufacturing, whatever? Uh, from, I've probably got two points in closing. Uh, from a business perspective, you must adopt zero tolerance. That's my new catchphrase, so just zero tolerance. Don't put up with it. If someone's doing the wrong thing, Hold them accountable. There's got to be zero tolerance. It's something simple that stays in my head and that's what I keep telling myself and telling what zero tolerance. We tell all our workers, that's just the way it is. If you don't like it, there's the door. From a personal perspective, it all comes back to um, all of these experiences in our life are brutal reminders that we need to appreciate our health, appreciate what we have, appreciate our family, tell them you love them, go home tonight and give them a hug and stop and smell the roses. It's not all about work. And um, final words when I have spoken before is always um, to pay respect to Dale because he's in our hearts and our thoughts forever. So thank you. Kate, you're a very brave lady. And people like you make the work that I do very worthwhile. And if, as I said earlier on, you know, if we can save someone from living the experience that you guys are living, um, I think it's all been well, well worth it. So thank you, Kate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you.